God has appointed his man's servant, Elder Almi, to deliver his message this morning. And we know that Elma, Elda, Elma Almi, sorry, tongue twister there, he is the man of God. He loves the word and he loves to share the word of God and we give praise for that. And the next voice you will hear will be that of Elda Mark. Tell me. There's a land beyond the river that they call the sweet forever. And we only reach that shore by fate's decree. One by one we'll gain the portal. There to dwell with the immortal when they ring those golden bells for you and me. Well, there's a land, there's a land beyond the river that they call, that they call the sea forever. And we only, and we only reach that shore, reach the shore by face a grief, face a grief, face a grief. In that far, in that far, forever. Oh, just beyond, just beyond the shining river. river. Oh. When, they mm. the oh, when they ring those golden bells, oh, when they ring, when they ring those golden bells, oh, when they ring, when they ring those golden bells. Can't you hear the angels singing? Oh, can't you hear? Can't you hear the angels singing? Well, it's the glory. It's the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jubilee, jubilee, jubilee. In that far and sweet forever. Oh, just beyond. Just beyond the sunny river. When the ring, when the ring goes golden bells. When the ring. When the ring goes golden bells, when the ring goes golden bells, for you and me, can't you hear the bells are ringing? Can't you hear? Can't you hear the angels singing? It's the glory, hallelujah, jubilee, jubilee, jubilee. In the forest with forever, oh, just beyond, just beyond the sunny river. When the ring, when the ring goes golden bells, when the ring goes golden bells, when the ring goes golden bells, for you and me. Sounded beautiful. I'm thankful for that. Isn't that nice? It's high noon. Right on the dot there. It's a good time to start. So as I meet with you today, as I always have explained that I am deeply thankful for the opportunity to study with you and to prepare something that the Lord has put upon my heart. So I ask that you Continue, as always, to pray for me as I stand here, because I am in need. I am absolutely in need, and nobody's special, that's for sure. So I need the prayers of those I love, and I just would ask that you would do that for me as I stand here today. So as I speak today, I the last time I was able to speak, uh, it was... oh. I don't know, a month ago, maybe a little longer. And they were putting in the tile here. And I said, they said, no, we're not going to meet at church. We're going to meet online. And that's fine. I love the technology. I'm glad that it's there for us. But it's something about seeing you face to face. And 
It's uh, God has put that electricity between us that we can feed off one another and to be able to enjoy one another's faces. Uh, you know that we went through a long period. We're not able to to do that, so we're glad that we're here. We're glad we're face to face, and I'm just thankful that we are at this point in history that we can uh, be able to explain in the courts of heaven that God got us through these difficult times. So by God's grace, uh, let's carry each other across the finish line as God carries us all. We're very thankful. So as I speak to you today, I have studied a doctrine that I want to share with you. And it's not a message today that will be one that is uh, flowery and allegorical. And, you know, it's, it's not that. It's, it's more of a teaching to give you an understanding of what God has put upon my heart. And I've been studying a doctrine that you know a little bit about. But it is a doctrine that the overwhelming majority of Christendom signs on to. Adventism, we don't. But this is a doctrine that has concerned me deeply because I've seen people actually leave churches because of it. And bear with me as I'm mysterious here, but it's a doctrine that unbelievably makes Christ look like he is worse than the worst murderer than you could even imagine. If you can even comprehend that someone would think, and you think, well, that's crazy. Who would worship someone like that? But indeed, this doctrine that we look at today will be clear that much of the world believes that there is a time or a place that Christ will inherit, will, will in, inflict torture on those who have not been adherents to the gospel. And it doesn't seem to add up to me. And I want to share with you what I've studied. And I want to share with you what we can look at together and maybe be able to explain going forward when anyone has a challenge about this doctrine that you can explain it to others. So study with me today as we begin to pray. We have to have a prayer, but we need to begin our study with prayer. So again, pray for me. Keep me on your tongue. Realize that I am just dust, but I need your help for that very reason. So let's pray together as we need. Father in heaven, we give you the praise, honor, and glory as we enter into your courts with praise. We give you this honor that you much deserve. So I pray that as I speak today, it's not too late to remove me and take me off this podium in favor of another. But should you choose to use me, I pray that you would loosen my tongue and give me the right thoughts for my mind. Let my heart be pure toward you. I pray that the hearer and the speaker today would be combined in glorifying God. Breathe upon us with your Holy Spirit. Forgive us of our sins and bless us as we proceed carefully as you lead. Keep us in your care in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I've mentioned, this doctrine, which I've been studying deeply, and again, you'll come to an understanding of what it is, but let me just share with you that there this world in which we live is one that is full of surprises. There's one, it is one that we have very special good times in which we have. We have good uh, people in our lives that are, that we engage with. We have uh, just a connection with, and we have a loving relationship. But as I've studied the world, looking anthropologically through society, and how we as a society are dealing with each other, I see that there are more bad people than good. There are those in this world that will do such evil things. It shouldn't be a surprise to you, and I'm going a little bit of a dark corner here, and I want you to bear with me if you would, please. 
there are those that would be willing to take the last penny from a widow and take her money and sit on a beach and just spend it while she's in poverty. People are willing to do that. There are people that are willing to harm other people in this world, which is a tragedy. There are people that are willing to abuse other people. And there are people that are even willing to take other people's lives. But as I studied this, the minds of people who are in this deep sin, I've studied this a little bit to try to understand what it is that makes people like that tick. And it comes to me that it is selfishness, that people want to fulfill their own physical, mental, emotional needs, and they begin to victimize other people. But I found that the worst of the worst are those that would not only just steal or harm or take another person's life, but one who would abduct another person and not take their life immediately, but would make them linger long enough so that they would be able to torture them. And again, this is a very dark place, but as I've studied this, this is the deepest trenches of sin. And you could say this is the worst of the worst. But again, there is a doctrine that much of the world believes in that says that Christ himself is even worse than anyone I've described. That he would make Hitler and Stalin and Mao Zedong look like choir boys in comparison. Follow with me. And you think, again, this is, doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody worship someone like that? But follow me as we study together. Go with, to, with me to Revelation 1, verse 18. This doctrine in which we study, again, Adventists don't sign on to it, but I want you to be able to explain it to others why that is not so. In verse 18, it says, Jesus quotes, I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death meaning the grave and the death. He has the keys. It's his prerogative on what happens to the wicked. And then follow me. Keep your finger there for a moment. And then follow me over to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You see, you connect these two verses together, and it says that Christ has the key of hell and death, and yet he's the sustainer of life. But this doctrine that I've been studying the doctrine of eternal burning hell fire. Gives the idea that Christ indeed is in charge of hell and death, but yet he sustains life in a place, a cauldron, a pit, in order to fulfill his bloodlust, in order to torment people throughout the endless ages of time. I can say with the confidence, my friend, that Christ is not in that. There is no question that there is a time and a place that the wicked will be destroyed. There is no, time, there is no question about that. But there is also no question that we do not serve a God that is a maniacal, homicidal maniac that would keep people alive by the sustaining of their lives in order to torture them for 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 years of life that didn't combine with Christ. He doesn't throw them in a pit to keep them alive, the sustainer of life, so that he might torture them. We're going to look at today what actually happens to the wicked as we study this together. But can you think of this? that there is this doctrine that's out there in Christendom. Again, please follow with me. 
that the sustainer of life in this belief would be one that would keep people alive, but get in confederation with the devil himself in a place called hell and say, you're in charge of that, but I'm the keeper of the keys. So can you imagine the devil and Jesus having a confederation to have a place that people would be tortured throughout the endless ages of time? It simply does not happen. You see, my friends, this is easily dispelled. We're going to look today even at the challenges that people challenge Seventh-day Adventists in this belief, that we believe that the wicked indeed will be destroyed because of their sin. But Christ does not keep people alive in order to torture them. There is no question about that. Follow with me. In order for us to understand, really, about hellfire, we do have to understand the resurrection because it leads one into the other. But I want you to go with me to the best, I should say, best known verse in the Bible in John 3, 16. And see if this, this verse itself may even clear it up with this verse alone about hellfire. It even mentions it if you're careful to see it. As we know this by heart, I hope you know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know about that. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But if there's a place called hell, and Christ keeps them alive throughout eternity, is that not eternal life? Not a very high quality of life. But they're alive, are they not? But that doesn't say what happens to the wicked. What does it say it happens to the wicked in this very verse? If it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. If you don't believe in Christ and live the life that Christ asked you to live, you would perish. That means there's nothing left of you. But the gift of God is eternal life for the righteous. The wicked do not get eternal life. They get death. It says they perish. Does that mean they lose their lives? No, they lose eternity. That should solve it. The wicked do not get eternal life. They get eternal death. The righteous get eternal life. Again, in order to understand this doctrine of hellfire, we have to understand the resurrection. So turn with me as we look at the resurrection. Turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we know the story of Lazarus. And we know this, so we have to study the resurrection in order to understand the truth about hellfire. And it says, now there was a certain man, verse one, that was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha, and we know that they were very good friends of Jesus. This is the same Mary that wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Lazarus is sick. When Jesus heard that, it says that he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Hmm. Even in verse 6, it says that when he heard that he was sick, he said he abode still two days where he was. And then he says in verse 7, let's be going to Judea again. And by verse 11, we find that Lazarus has already succumbed to death. However, Jesus explains this. We have to understand the resurrection and understand other doctrines in which we're studying. It says, these things said he after he has saith unto them, our fr friend Lazarus, we just said was sick. Now he says he sleeps, but I go to wake him out of his sleep. What did the disciples say? If he sleeps, he's doing well. He'll be just fine, right? Just go wake him up. How be it, Jesus spoke of his death. So it makes it clear that death is sleep. Then he said in verse 14, 
Lazarus is dead. Plainly, Jesus said unto them, plainly, Lazarus is dead. By verse 20, Martha hears about Jesus coming and says, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. It sounds like she's not terribly pleased with this situation. But she says, but I know that whatever you ask of God, he's going to give it to you. And Jesus makes it plain. Jesus says unto her, thy brother is going to rise again. And Martha says, I know. I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. You see, when we're studying this doctrine, we have to understand the resurrection as well. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, there will be a time of resurrection for the just. There absolutely will be. I'm going to do a special resurrection for your brother because I'm the resurrection and I'm here today to show you what I am capable of through my father. No question about it. Jesus was clear there is a resurrection. But what happens to the dead while they're awaiting this resurrection? Again, now turn with me to Psalms. we got a lot of movement we have to do today in Psalms 146. Psalms 146, verse 4. What happens during that time? Do people fly off to heaven? Do they descend in the pit of hell? And it says... His breath, verse 4, 146, 4, his breath goes forth. He returns to the earth, and in that very day, his thoughts perish. Is there anything cloudy about that? There is no thought. There's nothing else going on. Jesus was clear that there's a resurrection. He even said it in John chapter 6 and verse 54, he says, whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. So he makes it clear that there's a resurrection. We have to understand the resurrection in order to be able to contradict or contravene whatever they're saying about this doctrine, this false doctrine of hellfire. So we have to understand and be able to truly expound upon the resurrection. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. As we move through this quickly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to go into the challenges a little bit later. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have to account in this resurrection for every class of people. Verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. What did Jesus say Lazarus was doing? Sleeping. So it's talking about the dead. Goes on. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hmm. Hmm. So that takes care of two people, two classes of people. If we add in verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. It makes it very clear that we've accounted for when Christ comes, whom? The living righteous, the dead righteous, and whom else would be on the earth at that time? The living wicked. Are there living wicked at the time? Absolutely. Turn over one page in your Bible. What happens to them? We have to account for them. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So, the righteous are taken off to heaven. The wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming, the living wicked. There is no question about that. But who are we missing? Who we didn't account for? The wicked dead. Where are they at? They're in the grave. That's right. How do we find out where they're, what's going to happen to them? No question about it. We look at this. And we go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. It'll tell us what the story is with the wicked dead. We'll read chapters, chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. 
And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw souls that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Ah, we got an idea what's going to happen to the righteous now. The righteous that are taken off to heaven, they don't just go, you know, into some cloud somewhere. It says they're taken to heaven, that's for sure, but they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's talking about a millennium, a period of time. They're reigning with Christ for a thousand years. But it says we have to account for the other wicked. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. It says this is the first resurrection. This is a parenthetical statement about verse 4, about the righteous. But it says that the wicked will be resurrected in the second resurrection. How do we know that? We're going to follow this. So we've accounted for the righteous living, the righteous dead, the living wicked, and now the wicked dead. They're all accounted for. Something's going to happen to them. The Bible makes it clear. And then what happens? A thousand years has expired. First chapter 21 in Revelation. You should be right close to there. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We're leading up through this resurrection to determine how we get to hellfire. So New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, lands on the earth. All the righteous are in the city. It comes to the earth. It sits upon the earth. And then what happens? Those wicked that we, remember we had to account for them? They live not again until the thousand years are finished. Now the thousand years are finished. Look what happens in verse 9 of chapter 20. They, the wicked, went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp, the camp of the saints about in the beloved city and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. That, my friends, is hell fire. Does it say that throughout the endless ages, Christ will keep them alive to torture them? It says that they are devoured. Did you eat your breakfast this morning? So if you went back home this afternoon, when I'm done, you go back home, would your bowl of Cheerios still be sitting on the kitchen cabinet? Why? You devoured them. They're gone. So what does it say happens to the wicked? They're devoured. There's nothing left of them. There's nothing left of them. So when Christ comes, it says in 2 Peter 3, verse 8 through 10, particularly verse 9. It's, a, it's something Christ is not willing that any should perish. This is not something that he wants to do. He doesn't want to destroy the wicked. He wished they would have come to righteousness, but they were so glued to their sin. They went to their death and would not release it. So they wake up with the same character that they went to sleep with. And he has to come to destroy sin. How do I know this? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. What has Christ come to do? It says in verse John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, He that commits sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifest, that he might do what? Destroy the works of the devil, also known as sin. Christ had to come to destroy sin. He actually had to become sin for us. So my friends, the wicked are devoured. John 3.16 says they what? Perish. Does it sound like they're lingering in any way? What else? How do we describe? How can we be positive what happens to the wicked? Are they somewhere right now? The, the, those that have been wicked throughout the ages, are they in a pit somewhere being stirred by a call in a cauldron by a big giant stick that the devil has just stirring them and just doing the worst of the worst things to torture them? It says they're devoured. They perish. Now look at Malachi chapter four, just before Matthew. Malachi chapter four. It describes them in verse one. It says, for behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. 
in all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave neither root nor branch. That sound like they're lingering in any way? It sounds like a bundle of sticks that is burned and there's nothing left. They're stubble. John 3.16 says they are perished. They've perished. Malachi invert, goes on in verse 3 and says, And ye shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. This is allegorical language getting you to know that there is nothing less left as the writer of Malachi tells us, and he had to have been looking at the altar of burnt offering in the sanctuary when the fat would be burned. It would burn up to ashes. There would be nothing left. That's what happens to the wicked. As it goes on, we have to see if there's any more, if there's even more emphasis. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 24. We're looking at a lot more verses than I usually do, but I have to have some backing here. In Isaiah chapter 24, in verse 6, it says, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few left. Who's the ones that are left? The righteous, that's right. Absolutely. Let's see if it even gets more pointed. Turn with me to Psalms 37. We're moving around today. I'll give you a break here in a little bit. Psalms 37, let's see what happens to the wicked. Psalms 37 in verse 10. I don't know if you can get any more pointed than this. It says, for yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. That means you will see them no more. Yea, thou shalt do diligent, thou shalt diligent consider his place and it shall not be. Does it even get more pointed than that? Look at verse 20, but the wicked shall perish again, not just lose their lives, they'll lose eternity. They'll perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke and shall consume away. That's, there's no ambigu ambiguity there. Nothing, nothing can convince me that Christ, my Savior, is keeping people alive to torment them in his anger and fierceness. Now, he's coming to take vengeance on sin. Again, those that refuse to remove themselves from sin will be burned, just like if you refuse to leave a burning building. And the fireman says, get out. It's going to burn to the ground. And you refuse. You're going to burn with the building. Christ does not want any to be lost, but there are those that insist upon it. But I ask today, are there those that would come up with doctrines that would, shall I say, challenge what we're mentioning today? Of course. There are those that would come up with things that to say, well, the resurrection is not really a resurrection, even though we've had Paul and Jesus and multiple writers of the gospel say, of course there's a resurrection. And we're going to get our crown on the last day. How do I know this? Because Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul makes it painfully clear. And he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge shall give me when I go straight to heaven after I die. They give it to me on that day when, and not only to me, but unto all that love his appearing at his appearing. That's when you get your reward. That's when he says, that's when I'll get my crown. So we go back and people will challenge this, even though the words came from Paul's mouth in multiple places. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. So <clears throat> we're going into a phase of this study today, the challenges that come to Seventh-day Adventists, the challenge that people bring and see how we can develop and make sure that we have a good answer for the faith in which we have and be good apologists for the truth. Let's look at this carefully. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse eight. They say, oh, brother, oh, I got you here. You see what you got? You, you messed up. For we are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, Brother Omi, even though Paul mentioned a doctrine about a resurrection, he must have changed his mind right there. You fly off to heaven right away. 
But I can tell you that's not the case. Look at verse 1. Paul mentions in these first four verses that there is a heavenly body that we can look forward to. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 55. He says, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And he's mentioning this. He calls it our house, this body in which we have. For we know that if our earthly house, this tabernacle, were dissolved, if it were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You think, well, he's talking about the mansions. Well, let's see. See what Paul's talking about, because he's talking about his body. He says, for if in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our house, which is in the heavens. He wants to be clothed with his heavenly body. So he mentions something, and he says, you know, you could find yourself in a position where you are not yet acquired your heavenly body, and you have no working earthly body, what, what condition would that be? You'd be dead. And he says, I call that, Paul says, naked, because you have no functioning earthly body, and you have not yet received your heavenly body. And he says, verse 3, if so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked, dead, for we that are in this tabernacle, this body, do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. He did not want to face death. He did not want to have to die. He wanted to be what? Translated. He said, I want to forego the death process and be translated just like Isaiah. So then he goes, if that happens, then we are confident to say in verse 8, rather to be absent from the body, then I would be present with the Lord makes it painfully clear Paul wanted to be translated. Enoch, Elijah, let me be like those guys. As we look at this without question, Paul would not contradict that there is a resurrection. Of course there's a resurrection. He said it with his own voice. He said that was what his glorious hope was. Ah, brother, all me. You messed up, though. I found another one. Maybe you got an answer for that one. That's fine. You messed up. You got the, here's the knockout punch. You can't con contradict this here. Go back to 20 and verse 10, brother. Let me look at this. Chapter 20, verse 10, Revelation. I'm sorry. Revelation 20, verse 10. You don't have an answer for this one, I'm sure. But I can tell you this, outside our conversation here, my friends, that the Bible never, ever contradicts itself. It would not create a doctrine from one verse and how all of a sudden have Paul contradict himself or Christ contradicts himself. Or then when it says that the wicked are devoured and they perish, their ashes, their stubble, and there's nothing left of them, then it would all of a sudden say, we have a contradiction here in verse 10. And the devil and deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Obviously, they are in hell without end. No question about it. We lost the argument, right? Not so fast. What does it mean when the Bible says something goes on forever? By the way, there's no, in the King James Bible, the word forever, it's not in the Bible. As one word, it's not there. There's for, and there's ever, for a period of everlasting, but forever is not in the Bible. So as we look at this, we have to look at what for and ever means. Is it talking about the endless ages where the beast of the false prophet are, that they're tormented day and night forever and ever without end? There is a cauldron, like I say, that the devil is torturing them. No, because the devil says he actually dies as well. But we look at this carefully. What does the Bible mean when it says forever? Jonah said the same thing when he's in the belly of the whale. He says, when I was in the belly of the whale, he said that I was in there. What I could see went on forever, went to the vanishing point. It went on forever. It talks about eternal. When you go to look at Jude chapter 7, verse 7 rather, it says Sodom and Gomorrah was burned with eternal fire. The same concept, the same idea. Now you can go to the place where Sodom and Gomorrah are. You really can find it. I've seen a documentary on it. 
Is it still burning? So why does it say eternal? Why does it say this happens forever? What, what is the story there? Well, in an unsuspecting, unlikely place, I'll give you the answer. I'll give you the answer if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 22. What does the Bible mean when it says something that happens forever? Well, I can tell you a little bit about this when you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 22. And we know there was a lady named Hannah, and she wanted a son. She got a son. What was his name? Samuel, of course. Conveniently named after the book, I suppose. Or the book was named after him, I would have suspect. But she begged the Lord, please give me a son. Give me a son, and I will dedicate him to the service of the, of the temple. And you know what? She says in verse 22, but Hannah wouldn't go up to the festival that it was prescribed to go. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned till he stops nursing. And then I will bring him to the temple that he may abide where? In the temple forever. Now, is there still a temple? Is there still Samuel? But it says he would be there forever. So how long is forever? How long? Till he dies? Or as long as he lives? You think Hannah would corroborate that? Look at verse 28. Verse 28 makes it clear. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. So how long is forever? Till your days are over. So no, go back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And what does it say now? In context, it says, and the devil and the deceived them that was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are shall be tormented day and night for as long as they live. Till there's nothing left to burn. That makes it clear. So I want you to follow with me as we wrap this up. There's one chapter that Adventists steer way away from. And that's Luke 16. And this is the story that we know that Jesus in chapters 14, 15, and 16, he was having a study session that went on and on in this period of study and as he was a teacher. And this study, by the time you look at verse 19, it tells there was a rich man, certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at the gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass when the beggar died, he, carried, he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in the torments, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Like, ah, we got you, brother, homie, right there. You see, you really messed up this time. It says right there, this man's in hell and one's in heaven. But I ask you this. It goes on and Abraham has a conversation with Lazarus. There will be a time, my friends, when the righteous are in New Jerusalem. And there'll be a time when the wicked are outside the camp, as I described. And it says in this chapter, there's a great gulf between us. But they can't talk because this is a parable makes it painfully clear but there will be a time when the righteous as what jesus is saying there's consequences for your life here that you've done here consequences eternally you think that he would forget that there was a resurrection because he didn't mention it it's just telling where the rich man ended up he's telling you where lazarus ended up he's telling you what is happening to the righteous and what to, happens to the wicked the wicked will be tormented but for a short time not as long as people have espoused today how do i know that jesus didn't forget what he was talking about with the resurrection just keep your finger there and turn over just a couple pages in the same teaching where jesus was teaching parables in Luke chapter 14, verse 14, 14, 14, in the same series of parables, what does Jesus mention there? And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed when? At the resurrection of the just. He goes on and teaches more parables, and you think by chapter 16 he forgot? No. He's saying there are people that will end up here and there are people that will end up there, but he says the wicked will be destroyed. 
There is no question. We need not fear these challenges. We just need to be able to answer them well. Ah, so you have an answer for that one. But there's one more that I have for you. You can't get away from out from underneath so this one. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, Brother Omi, you explained verses 15, 16, and 17 that there's a resurrection of the righteous. And there is a translation of the righteous living. But you conveniently left out verse 14 that says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You see, Brother Almy, when Christ comes, he brings the righteous with him because they're already in heaven. So my answer is, then why in the next three verses does he talk about waking up the people that are already with him? The answer is that verses 16, 15, 16, and 17 tell about the resurrection of the righteous. Am I correct? Absolutely. And he's saying in verse 14 that he's going to bring them with him to heaven, not from heaven. Pretty simple. It, doesn't, it makes no sense to try to argue with people that want to argue. These people that, that, I, that we run across make these arguments, and they are straw men. Because the Bible is not going to contradict itself under any circumstances. We've seen some challenges here that people may bring to us, but they're easily dispelled by the truth of the resurrection and hellfire that the wicked perish, the wicked are destroyed, the wicked are stubble, the wicked are ashes, there's nothing left. And even if you saw none of that, the character of Christ would say that he leans toward mercy, not torture. I had a friend of mine, as I close, who was a brand new Adventist. I hope I get the story right, but I remember it's been a long time. But she said, and she was on fire. Uh, and, and she goes to a funeral where I'm from up north. And she went to a funeral by where we live. And it was at a church called Main Baptist. And of course, you go to the funeral and Uncle Joe's in, in heaven, right? He's walking the streets of gold and he's strumming a harp and he's doing, they always put him in heaven, right? <laughs> I couldn't have done it myself, but she confronted the pastor and said, do you really believe that? That people are taken off to heaven? And he says, no, but it brings comfort. But should we be comforted by that? A false doctrine? Look what it says in verse 18 we should be comforted with. It gives us the answer. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words that there's a resurrection. That's the answer, my friends. There is no question. What happens to the wicked? What happens to the righteous? Why Christ would lean toward mercy, even toward the wicked. You think he hates the wicked? No, he still loves them, but he has to destroy sin. And they would never let it go. So you walk into the sanctuary and you're in the holy place and you walk, if you're allowed to lock, look through the curtain, so you, you're allowed to go in there. You go in there, you're standing before the justice seat, right? What's the name of it? Now, Jesus has great justice that he will meet upon the wicked. But he sits on the, his father sits on the mercy seat because he leans toward mercy, even toward the wicked. My friends, if you have anyone that tells you that there is a place where the wicked go and they are condemned by Christ to work in confederation with the devil throughout the endless ages of time, tell them that that can't be true because your God leans toward mercy, that he will destroy the wicked, but he will not torture them. You go into the bookstore and they have a book about eternal burning hell, go to the front desk and tell them they need to put that in the fiction section. I thank God for the opportunity to speak to you today. And this is something that 
I had to get off my chest because I've seen people, multiple people that I've seen uh, just regular shows that I watch, you know, just cooking shows or whatever it is that I like to watch those things. And I've seen two guys that I like to, and I listen to their podcast as well. And they were talking about their spiritual life. They used to be missionaries. And they said one of the reasons why they left the church is because their church taught about a God of eternal burning hell, among other things. And I've heard people say that. So the, the devil is truly at work in this doctrine. So please, lift up Christ, the merciful one. Amen, saints. Let us pray. Father God, give us the strength, give us the courage to stand like the brave. You have given us wisdom. You have given us your word that we can speak boldly of what you need us to do as Christians. Help us, dear Lord, to reach out to those who are dying. They may be dying in ignorance, but they are dying in sin. And it's not your will that none should perish, but all should live eternity, eternity with you. So again, Father, please help us to stand like the brave. I pray, dear Father, that you will continue to bless and keep your children that we will continue to march forward knowing that our time here is just to an end. Have mercy on us, we pray. We thank you for the message, and we pray that you will continue to fortify the messenger and for all those you have called to deliver your message. May they stand like the great. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.